You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. My my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Pacific, uh, excuse me, on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, and it's also available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Uh, Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And also, as a note, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or david at thatgratitudeguy.com email, and I'll put that information in the show notes. So let me get on with the show and introduce you to my guest. Every week, I try to have intriguing, interesting guests, no exception this week. So let me tell you a little bit about Digvijay. Digvijay Shohan, after a successful career at Microsoft, Dig Vijay has co-founded multiple startups, included Ask Me Corporation, a web-based expertise sharing company, seeyourimpact.org, a grassroots storytelling nonprofit in which he continues to serve as its volunteer president, Giving Joy, a gratitude sharing application, and Vid Invite. Entrepreneurship and causes which involve service and technology give Dig Vijay joy. He travels frequently to India, which he says keeps his soul grounded in gratitude, my favorite word, and humility. Digvijay Shohan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, David. So delighted to be back. How are you doing? So I'm doing, I'm doing Thank you. I am doing well. It's so great to reconnect. And as a matter of fact, something I always start with, for those that listen to my podcast, I I have the same question I asked at the beginning and the same one at the end, and two different questions, but I always use to start and close the show. So to start, tell the viewers and listeners, because this goes out on YouTube and on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, how, to your recollection, did you and I meet? I think we met at uh, the Columbia Tower Club. I ran into someone who I was talking to about gratitude and uh, a very gracious, wonderful lady. I think Melody was her name. And she said, hey, you want to meet that gratitude guy? Do you know who he is? And I said, no. And so I said, I have to meet him with uh, knowing what you've told me about him. So that's kind of, I think she introduced us. And since then, it's it's been such a joy and actually inspiring in many ways to be able to spend time with you, David. Yeah, thank you. Likewise, Dave Vijay. And so kind of what I'd like to do to get the le- the listeners and viewers updated a little bit, I know kind of a, a fair amount of your history, but kind of go back and walk us back, maybe not, not necessarily to high school, but kind of college years, college age, and kind of tell us a little bit about your journey, how you started on the journey that you got on to do the things that you're doing. Okay. Oh, well, I grew up in India and, you know, in my... Um, Sometimes in the middle of my 20s, I think I decided that to learn a little bit more about how to do software engineering well, I wanted to get my graduate degree in software engineering. That's how I landed up in Seattle. Seattle U was one of the few universities in the early 90s that was offering a graduate course in software engineering. And at Seattle U, I... um, was fortunate enough that I had to pave my own way through grad school. So I was looking for a way to make money. And that's how I landed up, landed an internship at Microsoft and and then went on after my grad school to work there full time. It was uh, one of the most enjoyable, enjoy uh, bill uh, times of my life where I learned a lot about shipping software, worked with incredibly smart people and had a lot of fun. <laughs> And then in 99, this internet thing was happening and I knew I wouldn't be able to forgive myself if I didn't do something uh, as an entrepreneur in this space. So I left in 99 and started, uh, co-founded a, a startup called Ask Me. 
which was, um, uh, you can think of it as a version of Facebook where everyone was motivated and inspired to share what they were passionate about, to help other people by sharing their expertise. Mm -hmm. um, so if, let's say if you're passionate about gardening, then there was some, things, uh, some unique things you knew about it. And there were people who would connect with you and ask you about gardening. And, uh, and uh, that journey carried on. And after Ask Me uh, uh, was uh, sold and acquired, then uh, again, one of those moments where I knew if I didn't do something in the social impact nonprofit uh, world, then I wouldn't be able to live with myself. So I went ahead and I was very fortunate to have a, a, a philanthropic, a legend in the Northwest who's dedicated his life to philanthropy uh, since he left Microsoft, <laughs> uh, Scott Oakey. So with his help, I co-founded another non, uh, technology nonprofit, uh, which still is around to this day. It was, it's called See Your Impact. And uh, it's a platform where grassroots donors, there's a, these are people who um, want to spend a little bit of money and put it to some good use helping someone else. And so grassroots donors can actually see stories of lives they've changed. Mm -hmm. That was what Seer Impact was all about. And that journey made me realize uh, the joy of gratitude. And then I went on to do a couple more ventures. And right now, uh, that's what is keeping me busy is a video platform and a technology investment company where we invest in ideas and companies and technologies that we think are exciting. And that is currently one of the ventures we are launching is VidInvite. Uh, right. There, yeah, it'll help people make the special moments in their life magical with the help of video. With video. So let me go back a little bit here, um, kind of a neat uh, course that you were on. When you started out with the internship, I would assume, what is, does Microsoft bring in a couple of thousand interns every year and, and or thereabouts? And then how long is the internship? You know, thanks for asking. That was actually just a summer internship. I think they have thousands now. At that time, it was early 90s. I was, I, I think, joined as an intern in 92. Uh, so it was a summer internship, but since I had to pay my way through grad school, I managed to continue doing a year-long internship and went to school in the mornings and, uh, excuse me, in the evenings and worked at myself in the morning. So it turned into a one-year-long sort of an internship. For me, normally, it's just a summer internship. Well, and one thing I'm curious about too, with the, um, the many Indian people that I've met, I, get, I really get this sense that this culture of you're going to get educated. And first of all, we want you to be a doctor. And if you're not a doctor, then the next thing is going to be a software engineer. And anything less than that is not going to be a satisfactory. So how is it that you had to pay your own way? Is that just your folks? That's just the way it kind of worked or they didn't have the resources to help you through that? Uh, yes, you know, and, and I honestly think it was a blessing that I had to do that. Um, my father, uh, we came from an army background. My father uh, is a, a now retired officer of the Indian Army. And my parents, I think it's a reflection of the Indian culture, always believed that education was very important. So um, our parents sent us to the best schools possible, and they were a little expensive at that time as they still are. And so, you know, they, I guess, whatever resources they had, they put in our education. And that's a cultural thing in India too. I think education and learning is valued very highly as is respect to your elders and especially your teachers. And the concept of a guru started, that word literally came from India, so. Interesting. So then your very first, uh, after that, your very first uh, startup was Ask Me. Yes. And, and talk a little bit about more what that did. You mentioned it shared information to people about their passions. So was it kind of like, uh, wasn't there an Ask Jeeves at one point? That might've been something different, but how, tell me a little bit more about Ask Me. So Ask Me, um, at one point we had tens of thousands of people 
who had very rich profiles and had signed up to share their expertise in the area that they were passionate about. So gardening or um, uh, maybe sports, maybe relationships, maybe um, medicine, anything that they had been through. There were some people who uh, had uh, who answered something like you know 70, 80,000 questions. Oh my um, goodness! And they were uh, the, these questions were rated. So I guess my journey of discovering the joy of gratitude because these people would would do it for free. They wouldn't charge anything mm. for it. Kind of that was the beginning of my learnings about the joy of sharing and gratitude. Mm -hmm. And I think also you mentioned Scott Oakey, and I think uh, back as I think back to the history of uh, Microsoft, he was one of those first names that I remember beyond Bill Gates and and um, uh, Allen, uh, Paul Allen. Uh, but so did he have that same sort of philanthropic thr thrust that which is one of the reasons why you guys connected so well? Yes, yes, and you know the. Uh, he words his uh, his uh, statement describing the mission of his life after he retired is very interesting and actually very inspiring. He says it's, it's something about putting his passions of uh, philanthropy and uh, and startup life together to in a way that motivates and inspires other people. So yes, he was a part of that original team of Microsoft. I think he retired when I joined so I, he might have retired in 92 he was there precisely for 10 years mm -hmm. then has dedicated most of his time uh, to philanthropy and not many people know this but scott was actually the person who drove the first billion dollars in sales for oh wow wow he was also the person who went to the microsoft board and convinced them to bet on windows versus os2 which is kind of the probably one of the most important decisions that drove Microsoft's success. Yeah, yeah, and it's gotten just bigger from there on the way. And so so then talk a little bit about the gratitude piece, because as when you and I met, we talked a lot about that, and I, I think I kind of told you my story, and the listeners have heard me talk about my story about uh, finding gratitude, and specifically a gratitude journal, and, and uh, how it really helped to be a good coping mechanism for me, as I always say, in a world of a lot of deadly and destructive coping mechanisms, something where you have this gratitude journal, which I have mine that I sell to the people that see me talk and so forth uh, to really help you frame everything you have in your life with what you're grateful for and what you have and not worrying about what you don't. So talk a little bit about the gratitude piece for Digvijay. Yes, you know, um, I'll start from something very profound, but also very simple. I was fortunate to be in a conversation with somebody who's called a soldier saint in India. And he asked me, what did I think was the goal of life? You know, profound questions are, some, are like those you don't normally get asked, but to cut a long story short, he ended up sharing that uh, might be, the answer to that might be the goal of life is to be happy. And uh, everyone tries to reach there and different people have different paths. And, and it turns out if, if you explore that a little bit further, science has established, and um, this is in the words of, I think, the dean of, of one of the uh, most prestigious institutions that is well known in the country for the work they do in, in psychology and science also. Yale's uh, dean told me that uh, gratitude is one of the single most important markers from a scientific perspective of happiness. Mm. So, uh, so that's the science of it. <laughs> but uh, there's also tradition and culture. And you know, I, I'm sure this is in many other cultures, but growing up in India, this thread is always there in your life of how important gratitude is. So shukrana, which is gratitude in uh, one of the Indian languages, shukrkara and shukrana is something that almost everyone who is a spiritual teacher in India encourages you to do, be grateful, be grateful. And uh, in fact, it's so ubiquitous that, that it, you almost tune it out. <laughs> oh, wow, it's that obvious, wow. Yeah, so I think to, sum, to summarize both science and uh, philosophy have always stopped, have uh, val validated the fact that gratitude, how important it is to 
maybe the most important thing in life that everybody wants to be, which is to be happy. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree. And I think uh, when you're talking to the soldier, Saint Soldier, Saint, you, you told the goal of life, what is it to be happy? And then grat gratitude, single most important markers of happiness, one of the single most important markers. And I just find that one of the things I would be curious, Dig Vijay, around going back a little bit to the uh, the Microsoft connections that you made there, uh, as I said, Scott o Oakey, for instance, is very well known, uh, but maybe the lesser known or the people, and I think even you followed this path, is I think I'm always wondering when people retire so early, when they made a bunch of money, and to their, traditionally it would be in their 50s or 60s or sometimes 70s, and it seems like Microsoft was one of the first in the Seattle area and later Amazon and others where a lot of people because of their stock were retiring at 30 or 40 or uh, early 50s or whatever. But but I think it's it's interesting, though, that I've read enough about when people lose their purpose. So it's very clear to me that a Scott Oakey had a bigger purpose and to inspire and motivate others, as you said, that he said. And then, but talk about that a little bit about your experience where you're still a very young man and you've had some, some nice successes along the way, but how important was that establishing that purpose for you to give, you know, another one of those reasons to get up every day, if you will, because so many of us and a lot of people listening and the general public, I think the reason they get up here is they have to go to work, you know, that's one of the things they have to do. So how did that play a role for you? You know, it's very strange. I've asked myself that question and the, the answer is, I think this is a German philosopher, I think to the best of my recollection, who summarized it. He's, he said something like, you can do what you will, but you cannot will what you will. Mm. So your purpose maybe is something that comes from inside, which you don't have much control over, except trying to discover it. Right. And uh, I think I was always somehow, you know, always, uh, driven by a seeking of the, uh, what I realized later was spiritual courage. Spiritual courage is what uh, uh, addresses questions like, what is the goal of life? Why are we here? Those are the kind of questions that uh, are markers of spiritual courage. And in spite of me, nothing that I've done, I think that has always been an important part of my life. If I have to attribute it to someone, I'd probably attribute it to my mother and my culture. And I think when you've grown up in an environment where you see both sides of life, like extreme wealth, extreme poverty, extreme happiness, extreme suffering, then you can't but start thinking about why and what is the right path and why is it that some people have to go through so much. So I, I just think these are profound questions. For example, right now when the world went through a pandemic, I think a lot of us whether we wanted to or not, had to spend time with ourselves and ended up asking ourselves all these questions. Who am I spending time with? You know, who is it that really matters to me? Um, when you have more time, then I guess you spend a little bit more on, on uh, questions like, what is the purpose of my life? I guess when people didn't have to travel, they could work from home, they discovered a little bit more time. So, right. Um, maybe the poverty of time has something to do with this, how much, how much time we have to, to wonder and, about these things. And, and you mentioned, as an example, I'm always curious where motivation comes from. You mentioned your mother and your culture as two things. And so in the current configuration of Dig Vijay right now, and if somebody asked you that same person, the soldier saint or whatever, what, what's the purpose of your life? How would you answer that for you right now? I'd I'd answer exactly the same thing is for me is this is a journey that the journey of, of going to bed every night, being happy that you did your best in the day. And then you get up in the next morning and try and be a better person and be more at peace with your purpose. And the, the goal remains the same to be happy. And the only way he had pointed out to be happy, since if you connect your happiness to anything else, that will go away. You connect it to a car, the car will go away one day. You connect it to anything material, it will go away. So the only way to try and stay happy is to connect it to something inside. And the thing that is inside you is, uh, you know, your soul or different cultures, call it with different names. Um, most people who grow up in India believe there is some element of divinity in, in all beings living and and even 
those who don't have life in some way, shape or form. So I, I think it remains the same. Goal is to be happy. Just go to bed every night knowing that you at least made an effort to do your best and, and try and stay on that path every day. I heard, I heard something that uh, I've repeated a few times too about the goal is if you want to compare yourself to somebody is to try to be a better version of who you were yesterday you know, and try to always improve and so forth. And that's why I was curious about uh, your mom and your culture, as you mentioned that too, because I'm always curious where the motivation comes from. And one of the reasons, for instance, in my case, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to be a speaker when I was 19 years old. I'd gone and spoken to a class and I came back and got in my car. I was a freshman at the University of Washington. And I thought, I want to be, that's what I want to do someday. I want to be a motivational speaker. It just, and, it, and I didn't, it took me 45 years to you know, get the courage to do it and leave the corporate world and come out and do it and so forth. But it's been a game changer ever since then. And it's given me a purpose that I, I never had with anything else I did besides my children uh, in the work world that was anything even close to it. But, um, and, and I think one of the things I'd love your opinion on this is I, I, I'm, I'm a very positive person. And yet at the same time, I'm always surprised how negative it seems like a lot of people are. And I've said for years that if I was in downtown Seattle or something and, and I stopped 10 people on the street and I said, this is my friend Digbaje, he and I are going to start a chocolate chip cookie uh, company. We're going to sell cookies. My contention is, is that eight or nine out of 10 people would tell you what's wrong with that. You know, are you crazy? This, we're in a pandemic, you know, this, well, there's plenty of chocolate chip cookies around. And what is it about, what is in your opinion? Because you're, you're the antithesis of that. You, every time I've ever seen, I've never seen you without a smile on your face. You always have a smile on your face, always have a positive thing to say when I met you in person and since on Zoom or anything else. But what do you, what do you feel that, what is your thought on maybe why so many people just seem to be programmed to be on the negative side? Yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, uh, you know, for me, I'm just grateful I have... <laughs> people like you in my life so you and authenticity i think is a very rare thing and when you see it it's so joyful for me it's so joyful to see how authentic you are david oh thank you spreading gratitude and you know you uh it took you some time but you are following your dream you are doing what you uh wanted to do and i think that is unfortunately a little rare mm -hmm. i think Maybe for, again, I, I, I'm no one to judge, but maybe people don't have that uh, or feel they don't have the ability to follow their heart for whatever reason. Mm. They might be because they have responsibility, they feel they have responsibilities or whatever. But when, when you're following your heart, I guess you're a little bit more positive. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe that's the reason, I don't know, but I, I, I just... You know, I just pinch myself many times because I have people like you in my life and, and oh, others who are very, very positive and inspirational in so many ways. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And and I think sometimes it's um, gosh, as you as you get older, you're you just if you pay attention to the lessons in life, you gain so much wisdom and you get smarter, wiser, all those things, and you just can learn from all these events in your life and the path that you took. And, and one of the things that I think about is I believe that everybody was given certain gifts. And I, I feel the gift for me was to take advantage of this fact that I can speak to large groups of people and tell them about gratitude. And one of the things I say in one of my modules is find yourself, find your talent, find your passion, find your purpose. And I start out with find yourself, which is the relationship you have with the person in the mirror. And it's important to have a very good relationship with them and then find your talent. And when I talk about talent, I say, make your strengths productive, make your weaknesses irrelevant. So I can go speak to 10,000 soldiers at Joint Base Lewis McCord, but I can't draw a circle to save my life. So I'm not going to go take an art class. You know, it's just, it doesn't, that's not my specialty. My specialty is speaking and, and getting the message out to people. And so, and I think for, as I know, since the day I met you, uh, so positive, always outgoing, always a positive thing to say, always a smile on your face, those kinds of things. And I, I think in some ways to go back in your life, you mentioned this just offhandedly, but I think, cause I went through the same thing, but you mentioned Seattle University, you paid your own way. And, and I think that there were some seeds in that alone where if it is to be, it's up to me. So Digbeje, if you didn't make the money, you weren't going to get through school. And I paid my way through the University of Washington. And I've met a lot of people that 
you know, had the, it was all laid out like the red carpet from their parents. And they never seemed to have the appreciation for it that I think that somebody like you did or like I did because it, you worked hard to get that education. You think yeah. that's the case for you? I don't know. You know, I've been very fortunate. I've been very privileged in so many ways. So I, you know, for example, I'll, I'll tell you things that happened to me which are not of my doing that I benefited a lot from. Mm. So I didn't do anything to deserve to go to such good, good, good elementary schools or secondary schools, right? And I, I can't take credit for that. That was all my parents and where I was born. And, you know, so I'm not so sure that it's all my doing, but, uh, um, you know, as, as I've gotten more <laughs> white and, uh, you know, when, when we were, when, when I was at Microsoft, it was a very, very aggressive culture. It had a joke that Microsoft is a very diverse place. They have type A Chinese and type A Indians and type A Germans and type A Americans. <laughs> but we were all type A and, you know, maybe we, we felt that uh, we could, uh, it was all our doing, but as I've grown older, I, you know, I realized, I reached a conclusion that sometimes things happen in spite of us. And if we can just enjoy them and uh, spread joy and love and happiness, then we'll be happy. <laughs> it's so important. And speaking of spreading uh, joy and happiness, what are some of the things, because I think each generation, I know I've certainly tried to do this with my sons, tries to impart wisdom and things that we've learned and some lessons we've learned. What are some of the current um, lessons, if you will, that you felt you've tried to pass on to your kids? You know, um, that's a really good question. And uh, there is this uh, concept, especially in the older cultures, the more in the East than in the West, that uh, there's a lot of wisdom and there's a lot of things to be passed on to the next generation. I actually feel there's a lot I learn. I can learn from our younger generation. They are, I think, more aware of things worldwide than I was. Uh, so for my children, I'm always, my approach is uh, some, uh, a line that I learned from one of my best managers at Microsoft, his name is Ted Kumrit. <laughs> his, his line was, how can I help? Mm. And he was genuine about that and he is genuine about that. And so I think, you know, with my kids, uh, I look less to pass them on anything. Anything that I do, they learn from. So, you know, if I am a certain way, I tell them my language of love is honesty. So you should always feel uh, that you can be honest with me, but how can I help you be more joyful and how can I learn from them? They are, I think, uh, really more caring than I was at their age maybe. And I see this younger generation it actually does inspire me. You know, they are idealists. And sometimes maybe uh, we haven't done enough to to support their idealism, but I'm, I'm not so sure. Sorry, I didn't answer that question. I think uh, when I look back at it, the only thing I can, I can uh, pass them on is with my actions, live, live my, live, uh, walk the talk. If I tell mm -hmm. them that, you know, I think this being this way will help you be better and be more joyful in life, then they should be able to see me joyful and wonder what is it that I do to be that way and then want to be that way. And then, so, um, and then let them teach me things that I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. No, it's interesting that they label all the generations, Gen X, Gen Y, and then the millennials and so forth. And, and I've often thought it's easy to kind of poo poo each new generation. And, you know, they've grown up with cell phones or whatever the example might be. And yet I read enough about the millennials as an example, and there's a newer generation, I think now, but it's, I love some of the things they came up with and, and just some, some practical things. Why does everybody need a car? Why, why don't you just take Uber, which of course is something that's been only come about in the last five or 10 years, but, but it's interesting. And do you really need to just get married, get a house, get a car, get, you know, and they're saying, let's travel Europe and let's go there for six months or a year. Let's get our travel out early here before we settle down and, and how they look at a job. And of course, then the pandemic really exacerbated a lot of these things because people were not in their jobs. And then a lot of people didn't come back. And I just think it's, it's, it's so great because you can learn from every generation. And you mentioned uh, the person that one of the people that inspired you at Microsoft and how can I help? And I think about that line about if you want to help yourself, help other people. 
And they sometimes when I know if I'm having a tough day or things aren't going quite right, uh, boy, the best thing I can do is, is reach out and help somebody else. And it makes you feel so much better and kind of brightens your day. So it's, it's amazing what you can learn from people. And, and so, so shifting a little forward where you're, again, the path that you've gone on, uh, I meet a lot of people that, you know, work, you know, in a traditional job, if you will, to their 60s or 70s or whatever it might be, and having found a different path. And as you said, you were very fortunate to some of the people you worked with. Talk to me a little bit about how Digbajay sees the future five or 10 years for you, other than getting the kids, you know, raised in college and, and off on their own and so forth. How do you think the next five or 10 years look for you that um, you may not have thought they'd look this way when you were younger? Yes, thank you for asking. You know that I, again, I have a, my, my life may not apply to others. And so I apologize if this is not very relevant to them, but I have, my folks are in India. My father is in his, I just came back after spending almost a month there. Hmm. Um, and so as far as my life is concerned, we have one kid still in school. We have two in college. One has graduated uh, and the, mostly thanks to their mother rather than me. They, we, are, we are really very fortunate that they're quite self-sufficient and taking care of themselves. So we have one more kid. He is uh, in eighth grade, going to nine, so four or five years um, more. We are sort of his coaches <laughs> for life maybe. And then, and then uh, I do see myself and, um, and uh, my wife and I, we see ourselves spending more time in India and in the US both. So um, that's given us a very unique perspective about, you know, Asia and the West have always been a, a very different worlds and there's a lot to learn in both worlds from each other. And even today I see the differences, I see the challenges in one world that, and some different challenges in the other. So it just gives you a good perspective really it does ground me in humility and gratitude when I spend some time there because you get to see so much diversity, mm. uh, so much more di economic diversity and diversity of emotions and opportunity also maybe. Um, so I see myself in the next five, 10 years, first continuing to follow my passion. And what you said, uh, David, about you know, you talked about how you, in your speeches, you tell people to find themselves and find their purpose and find what they're good at. It's actually incredible how well that correlates with one of the most successful sports coaches in American history, John Wooden. Uh, his whole coaching philosophy, which is the pyramid of success, which uh, uh, creates world-class athletes, is exactly the same thing that everyone is blessed with something be the best that you can be and every day get up and try and beat yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so I think on that note, so I'll continue doing, I know a little bit about technology, a lot about, uh, very little about a lot of other things in the world. So focus on technology, see how I can keep doing what I enjoy with technology uh, uh, for, for my skill set and for doing things in mundane things in the world and then continue trying to see uh, how I can be more joyful or be more happy and peaceful by following this path of service that's, that I seem to have no option but to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, I, I, I have a number of friends I can think of three or four recently that are moving to different parts of the country to be by their kids that are now grown. And you mentioned uh, one college, one graduated, and then uh, in your eighth grade, uh, I believe it's your son is in eighth grade, correct? And, yeah. and when he's on his way up to college, and you mentioned going to India and spending a month there and seeing your mom and dad, it'll be interesting to see where all the kids go because I've noticed um, one of my sons, my older son lives here in Seattle, my other son lives in Sacramento, and it's hard when they're away from you. You want to stay at least relatively close and things. So I would imagine how the the kiddies decide where they're going to go live and make their lives will determine a little bit about how much time Digvijay and mom get to spend with them. So that'll be interesting how that works out. Yes, yes, absolutely. And we are hoping that, you know, when we, that they'll also, I, I, I tell them that, look, the three, two, three cultures that are going to be, whether you like it or not, whether you agree or disagree, they're going to be dominant in many aspects in this world. And 
aspects of just because of population and uh, economics, and that is the Indian, the Chinese, and the American culture. These three cultures will touch a part of your life, whether you like it or not, in some way, shape, or form. So I encourage them to also stay connected to India, learn from there. So hopefully they'll come and spend some time there. Hopefully we'll be able to come spend some time here in the U.S. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, and that's and I never really thought about the Indian, the Chinese, and the American culture. Uh, three kind of powerhouses. In fact, sometimes I forget that, um, gosh, the population of India is, is because given the size that it is, it's maybe two or three times the density that the United States is, for instance. There's a lot of people in India, so that that represents a, quite a force as well as the Chinese as well. But that's a good point, kind of paying attention to all three. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It's cool. So, so let me, uh, I just want to go over and just talk about a couple of things that you, I always like to get to some kind of highlights and things. And um, when you said, what was the goal in life and be happy and uh, gratitude and is, it's hard. It's one of his gratitude is the single most important markers of happiness. I thought was really good. Uh, spiritual cult, uh, spiritual cult, courage. I can't get it out there. Um, and then talking about just, just to the kids or to anybody, uh, do your best, be at peace, uh, be a better person today, Ke connect with something inside you. I thought those were really good. Um, authenticity, and then, you know, all the type A, that was kind of funny. And then the guy that says, how can I help? I just think that when I said earlier about, do you want to help yourself, help other people, I think is just so, so, so important. So, well, let me wrap, we're going to wrap up. And I want to, uh, as I mentioned, I always wrap up with the same question for everybody. Uh, what does Dig Vijay Shohan know today that you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you? I think, uh... The one line that I would have liked to know at 18 that I know today is that it doesn't matter what I'm doing or what I've done, I am no better than anyone else and no one else is worse than me. Mm. So just be grounded in that all the time. And I think that, uh, you know, true humility comes from really believing that, that, uh, Every person is on their own path. I, I like it to a, a person standing on Mother Earth. It's a round, uh, you know, it's a round sphere, and everyone who's standing has a unique line connecting them to the center. Mm -hmm. So I just believe that all I can, all I can know and do is about myself and how I can do something better, but not be in the. In the well, and I think too, you figure the different people you work with and that you impact. And you have uh, your three kitties. I have two sons. And I used to say when in the early parts of, my, parts of my talk, I would talk about how managing people, when I managed those big stores that had five or 600 employees or raising kids, I think they both require the same basic skill. And that is that ability to set a really good example. I just think it's so hard to say, I want you to behave one way, but I behave another way. Yeah. You know? and, and so I just think that, uh, and then I love what you just said about your, the wrap up too. It doesn't matter. No one's better than me and they're no better than me. I'm no better than them. And I still, for some reason, I'm just struck by things I see on TV or different things where people are just so rude to people. Yeah. And I just, I, and I don't smack people, but I want to go up and smack them and go, what, how dare you? You're acting like you're better than that person. We're all just doing our best. Yeah. You know? And as I say, some have some skill sets and some others, and especially I guess where it comes out and I don't watch this as much anymore, but anything that has this to do with celebrities and they got celebrities that are just behaving poorly because they think there's something special. So it, it's always a shame because I, I think we're all just doing our best. Yeah. So, excellent. Well, listen, my friend, thank you so much. Let me tell all the listeners as I wrap up here, just a couple of reminders on my weekly podcast. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. And it's about available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Uh, please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. Again, always appreciated. And then also, I like to always mention to my listeners, I know that people are struggling with all sorts of life issues and may need some support. Anything around anxiety, depression, work-related work things, health, financials, family, that kind of thing. I have a gratitude coaching program that can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. And clients report back to me that it's dramatically shortened their learning curve and they get a derailed life back on track again. So 
I offer a 30 minute complimentary coaching consultation to anybody that would want some on the spot coaching. And if you're interested, you just call or just text rather the word coach, C-O-A-C-H to my text number 206-371-8309. And I will get back to you with more information. And for those that are interested, a lot of people ask about the Monday morning minute. I send out a 60 second video every Monday morning kind of to inspire you for the week and get you started. And it's always about gratitude. And if you'd like that, go to your text uh, on your phone and text to the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And in the message box, put in gratitude guy, all one word and send, and that'll get you signed up for that. So lastly, thank you so much for tuning in. I always appreciate the viewers and listeners. And until next time, remember, be grateful and never quit. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us. And you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.